welcome to our second video on tactics. Today we are going to look at body mechanics, in particular the essential components that are involved in any action delivered in swordplay, like executing a blow or a thrust. We fortunately have two professionals here who are going to help us with our first demonstration. It is my personal pleasure to introduce to you Ursus Solve. and Valerius. Solve. Please note that both of them are professional and highly trained swordsmen with years of experience in close combat. So we strongly discourage imitating what you are going to see next. In the following demonstration, Valerius is going to deliver a thrust at Ursus. And what I would like you to pay particular attention to is which components of the body are actually employed in bridging distance and delivering that thrust. As you can see, Ursus is now wearing a helmet for the sake of safety. Let us watch this again in slow-mo. So here Valerius initiates the thrust by extending his arm, then he leans in with the body and finally moves his foot to take a step. Hand, body, foot. The relevance of these three body sections in delivering a combat action in swordplay was pointed out by English swordsman George Silver in his treatise Paradoxes of Defense, written in 1599. Hand, body, foot or feet are all involved in bridging distance between combatants. And what is particularly interesting is that they move at a different speed each. We're now trying to visualize that in another demonstration. Karen is now going to attempt to slap me. I will try to avoid being hit by leaning back. Note that she is already leaning forward, her arm fully extended. As you can see, the only way for Karen to bring her hand into the target is by taking a step, while all I have to do is to lean back. My torso moves faster than her foot, which has to carry the whole weight of her body. Now Karen is already standing so close that she doesn't have to take a step. With her arm fully extended, she has to lean in to bring the hand into the target. So, let's see if I can escape that one too. This one was much more difficult to avoid for me, because the both of us were moving at the same speed. George Silver would say, at time of the body. Karen did come closer, because I need a short moment to react, and during my reaction time, She's already bridging distance. Now finally, Karen is standing so close that all she has to do is extend her arm. I wonder how this one goes. Oh. <laughs> okay, I think it's plain obvious that her hand is faster than my body. So we have made the observation that the hand is the fastest mover, followed by the body, which in turn is faster than foot or feet, which are the slowest movers. An interesting question arises from here. When I want to deliver a blow or a thrust from maximum distance, the so-called wide measure, so that I have to take a step is there a particular order for hand, body, foot? Let us first look at an attack delivered with the foot moving first, then followed by the body and finally by the hand. Now make the following experiment. 
Clap your hands as soon as you see the swordsman move. Clap a second time when the blow is concluded. Are you ready? Now compare this to an attack delivered with a hand moving first, followed by the body and finally a step. Ready to clap your hands again? As you can see, it is hardly possible to clap your hands twice during the tempo of an attack that moves the weapon first. Silver calls this acting in true time. It is quite obvious that attacking with moving the foot first is tactically inferior because the action is signaled long before the weapon comes forward. George Silver called the order of foot, body, hand moving in false time. The main disadvantage of attacking in false time is that the opponent's target, which is the body, is moved forward before the threat is presented, which is the weapon. You may say that stepping first, uncoiling the body and then following with the arm to strike makes for a more powerful blow. And that may be true. So, striking in false time may be the appropriate choice for an executioner. But entering in true time is clearly the better tactics in combat. But what about moving hand, body, foot all at the same time? Wouldn't that make for a shorter tempo and thus for an even faster attack? Let us examine this by looking at a play from the manuscript 133. On folio 17R, we see the priest in sixth ward being beleaguered by the student. Now, the priest may succeed in delivering a thrust, but the student may overbind his blade before he is able to execute his thrust. And from this situation, the student would launch his counterattack. So in our next demonstration we will see a thrust from 6th ward against half shield, moving hand, body, foot simultaneously. As you can see, it is well possible to perform this attack successfully with feet and hands moving at the same time. But the problems start when the thrust is being intercepted. Having already committed to a new position by taking a step early on, the attacker has no chance to respond to the pressure signals from the blade bind in time. Let us see what happens if the thrust is performed in true times. Apparently, it is still possible to directly hit if the opponent fails to act. But it is also possible to respond to an overbind in time, because the moment the thruster feels his opponent's superior pressure, his foot has not yet committed to a new position and he can retreat and counter. So it seems that the plays in 133 can only be successfully performed in true times. But is there an actual reference in the treatise that there was an awareness for a refined tactical concept that was described by George Silver some 300 years after the manuscript was written? Now, on this folio, the author introduces an obsessio, namely long point, used to put pressure on the priest in his underarm ward, also called first ward. Now, interestingly, the text says that this obsessio is a common one 
and not particularly advantageous. Why is that? Well, as you can see, the attacker's arms are already fully extended. So the only way for him to bring the blade into the target is by stepping, by moving in time of the foot. But as we have already seen, this is a comparably slow entry that can be easily responded to in a faster time. To me it is clear that 133's author was well aware of what George Silver called true times. And that is not really surprising because martial arts always follow the parameters that are set by anatomy and physics. And these remain unaltered through the ages. So does that mean that not using true times is unhistorical? Obviously not, or else 133 wouldn't have pointed out the disadvantage of stepping forward in long point. And George Silver would have never mourned the deaths of English swordsmen who had ignored these principles. So fencing and false times is absolutely historical. It is just not as Timicatoria, Kunst des Fechtens, or the art of combat. Agimus gratias pro attention in Vestrum. Semper pugnate in tempore vero.